Good evening, everyone. I'm Barkhadat, and you're watching the Mojo Story, our independent digital platform that does a deep dive into the big stories of the day. I'm pretty sure that no matter which part of the world you live in, nobody's slept in the last many hours. If you live in India or this part of the world, you've been up all night watching the absolute chaos at Capitol Hill, scenes that were unimaginable for most Americans, and I think most of the world could not have believed that this could ever happen in a country that has often positioned itself as the global watchdog of democracy and has often described itself as the leading country of what American sitcoms like to call the free world. Well, it was a rude reality check for the United States of America in more ways than one. It is official now. Joe Biden will be the next president. Many Republicans have moved away from Donald Trump, including Vice President Mike Pence, but not before, not before Biden had to go on TV and say to Trump, come out and condemn the mob at Capitol Hill. But Trump, of course, did nothing of the kind. He did ask the mob invited by him in the first place to go home, but signed off saying that he loved what he called special people. On this special broadcast, over the next 60 minutes, we'll be looking at some of the grand delusions that have come home to roost for the United States of America, what that does to the way the world perceives America, and whether anyone will take the United States seriously the next time it tries to lecture other countries on their track record on democracy. More than one Indian, and actually more than one South Asian, has sniggered today about the third world reference by Marco Rubio, who claimed that the third world, as he called it, was laughing at the United States of America. Well, America actually just got itself a very first world problem. To understand this and also look at lessons for the world, maybe lessons for all of us, lessons for all democracies everywhere. Let's introduce uh, our panel on the program today, a very uh, interesting panel as always, and I'll introduce them one by one. We have Atish uh, Tasir, well-known uh, author and columnist. We have Ambassador uh, Casey Singh, uh, who's of course a veteran diplomat. Uh, we have uh, Jonah Blank, who's an author, but has also actually worked with uh, Joe Biden when he was vice president, has worked on uh, the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations for South Asia and has worked with the Obama administration. And we're joined by Sadanand Dhume, a Wall Street Journal columnist and a commentator. And over the course of the next 60 minutes, many other people from different parts of the world will be tuning in uh, as well. So let's get uh, straight uh, into it. And I will actually start uh, with you, Sadanand, if I may. And there's a reason for that. And the reason for that is uh, that you never actually believed that it would come to this. On previous programs, uh, on this very platform, you said that there would eventually be a peaceful transition uh, of, of power, and, and everything else was just rhetoric. You went on Twitter today uh, to say that you were wrong. What the hell happened? Well, I mean, Barkha, in fairness to me, there was more than 200 years of history behind me. Uh, <laughs> when I, um, yeah. you know. yeah. So I, I obviously I didn't think this was I see this coming. Um, I would argue that most people did not see this coming. Um, beyond that, you know, we have there's a long history in the United States of uh, the losing candidate uh, accepting defeat, I and mean, this has happened even when elections have been contentious. Uh, it happened in 2000, famously, when Al Gore was defeated by just a few hundred votes in Florida. Uh, it happened in uh, four years ago when uh, Hillary Clinton won the popular vote but lost the electoral in the electoral college and accepted defeat. And mm -hmm. uh, my view was that the institutions and norms are simply stronger or too strong for one violent, disruptive personality uh, to overwhelm. And obviously, I uh, underestimated the, the the how much that particular violent, disruptive personality, in this case, Donald Trump, the amount of damage he could do. Um, so I was proven wrong. Obviously, the those uh, shocking scenes that we saw uh, really beamed around the world will you know, um, influence how many people view American democracy. But let me just quickly add one last thing, which is that in the end, um, you do notice that everybody, the members of Congress filed back. The process was completed in an orderly yeah. way. Joe yeah. Biden has been certified as president. So in the end, uh, it's not as though uh, Trump is going to be able to hang on. Uh, this is chaotic. It's troubling. Um, I, this is a stress test that I would not have liked any system to see. But I still think even though the U.S. is dented, uh, it will emerge at the other end with, with, with Joe Biden as president. So I think what I'm hearing you say is that institutionally, you still believe that the United States functioned as, a, you know, as the world's oldest democracy ought to have. 
Institutionally, in the end, even Trump's closest collaborator dumped him. Some would argue that all the spate of resignations we're now seeing by the Republicans, the distancing we're seeing, whether by Pence or Lindsey Graham, is just too convenient. It's too last moment. It's after the damage was done. It's after uh, they, they, they didn't leave him when Trump actually addressed that crowd of protesters, literally invited them to the Capitol Hill, refused to even uh, sort of condemn them, even after images like this that we're seeing on our screen shocked the world. Uh, do you really believe that the institutions of democracy worked as they ought to have, Sadana? No, um, but I, I believe that they are battered, but not broken. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, let me let me now bring in Ambassador Casey Singh. Uh, at this point, Ambassador Casey Singh, there's a lot of uh, uh, minor gloating that's taking place in our part of the world, mostly because most countries have been singed uh, by American criticism of how our democracies uh, function. And you know, uh, I mean, I was I was saying to Atish before the program began uh, began that actually they make uh, you know a lot of our problems seem tame by comparison because. At least ever since I can remember, I can't remember anybody beyond a minor choo-choo over EVM machines not accepting the result of an election. So, you know, from the Indian perch, what are we seeing happening in the United States of America? And as it stands battered but not broken, does it lose some of its moral smugness in the global order? Uh, two points. I'll come to America later. But coming to India, uh, look, we also have a right-wing populist leader. Uh, Brazil has it. Uh, we've also got in uh, in Britain. Uh, and in different measures, they have debased their systems. Now, in India, we may not have a mob entering the parliament, uh, but BJP doesn't need it because he doesn't uh, allow the opposition to function. It disrupts the function without the requirement of a mob entering the parliament. Uh, so essentially, that is what happened with the farmer's bill. They didn't even allow a debate. They didn't send it to a committee. They won't let any uh, contrary opinion come up. And now they are negotiating with farmers at the, at the boundaries but to, but, of Delhi. But to, but, but to be fair, I have not seen the BJP refuse to accept the result of, let's say, any state election no. is lost. I haven't seen BJP uh, supporters go and grab and storm a state assembly after the result hasn't gone their way. I have not seen this happening in India. No. Many, many terrible things have happened here. Uh, so I don't want to be, make this a nationalist point. Many terrible things have happened in our country, but I have never seen this happen. But what have you seen? That you lose a mandate, then you go and buy the MLAs. Uh, so in Madhya Pradesh, you bring the government down. You delay the locking down of India because on March 11, WHO declared a pandemic. And we waited 15 days to lock down India because they wanted to bring the government down in Madhya Pradesh. And until they brought the government down, they would not declare the lockdown. And then they had a last minute lockdown, which caused so much chaos for the laborers and the workers. Is it the same? So, you know, is it the same? So, is it the same? No, you can't have a carbon copy. I'm just telling you how institutions get bent. And okay. it will be different for each country. Each country's progress away from normal democracy starts in a different way. But it begins by bending institutions, uh, bringing courts to heel, uh, not listening to opposition. Uh, not even letting them win. When they win, you buy their MLAs. Uh, you okay. induct them wholesale. And you see what's happened in Bihar just now. Uh, they've got a coalition with someone and they go and buy his MLAs in Arunachal Pradesh. No, these are all signals of how you debase a democracy. And these are the dangers from right-wing leaders. Now, coming to America itself, very quickly, uh, you know, we were looking forward to Biden restoring some of the uh, value system on which America has functioned, not consistently always. Because when real politics comes in, it can't be all principle. Uh, but he had announced that he'll have a gathering of democracies in U.S. and gather the democracies to counter China. You see what's happened in Europe. Uh, the Europeans, Mike Sullivan, in the middle of December, the NSA designate, tweeted that Europe should wait for us. When we come in, we will get together and then deal with China. Uh, the Europeans, under the leadership of Merkel, went and signed at the end of the year an investment agreement, agreement with China which negates all your decoupling, all your economic pressure, uh, some of the good things that Trump had done, which means they had, even Europeans were convinced, Trump may be defeated, but Trumpism isn't over. And therefore, you okay. know, that is a question to ask. Like in India, you may displace BJP, but that doesn't mean Hindutva will leave overnight. I so think that's the important what, point, that when Sadhana uh -huh, says it all but ended and it should have... But yeah. If I may yeah. just finish. Please, uh, please. Therefore, what we are seeing is, 
the party Republicans got very late. They allowed somebody like Trump to write. It's happened in the past also. They've been extreme right wing rebel rousers who could have become president of America. But the party contained them and did give the nomination to them. In this case, the first fault was letting the nomination go to him. And then when has he ever said in the last six months he will accept orderly transition? Whenever he was asked a question, he never answered it, that he will accept orderly transition. And therefore, let's not be surprised. He was always headed in this direction. But the only positive thing is that in the Senate, by the end of it, the only six senators who were willing to go to one side out of 100, yeah. the rest realized that this had gone too far, although I think they started too late. They didn't okay. check him when the time was right. But okay. in the House, there are still 150 guys who went along sure. with him. So therefore, sure. you know, that is a danger which, uh, which Biden faces. And that's why I'm actually calling it a reality check uh, uh, for the United States of America. I do agree, uh, Atish, let me take this to you and then I'll, I'll, I'll get Jonah uh, to respond. I do agree with Sadhanan that in the end, structurally, it worked. The election uh, ended in the result that the people of the United States of America had voted for. But I think Casey is right in saying that Trumpism isn't over, that it has revealed an underbelly to the United States of America that perhaps Americans didn't understand uh, was this murky, was this divisive. Uh, I think a lot of people just dismissed it as as, 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 as rhetoric, right? Uh, how, how do you see it from your perch, who's actually known three countries, New York, which is your home now, uh, Pakistan, which you which you have, uh, you know, have fa family links with, and India, which is also your home, though, uh, at least for the moment, you can't come home. Go ahead. Um, so the, 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 the thing that strikes me most is, <clears throat> I was just in Turkey, for instance, and the point that Casey made is absolutely right. This is something that for maybe 15 years has been sweeping the world, this, the, the, the rise of this kind of autocratic leader. We thought it was maybe a third world phenomena. It's not. The first world from the capitals of Eastern Europe to right to Washington, D.C. has produced this kind of man. And the question is, how does a democracy or a system deal with it? In so many places, I've seen the system like absolutely vanquished, where the opposition collapses, the press collapses, the judiciary collapses. And I have to say that hideous as yesterday was, mm -hmm. and I really do think it was in some ways a kind of last gasp of this ugly ugliness. We've like at every step, he's been blocked, controlled, people who he nominated to do his bidding stood up to him. And so it may be said of America that America was hit by this global phenomena and where other countries were absolutely, their political system was lost. We saw here a free and fair election that won us the Senate, that won us the House, that won us the presidency. And this rather ugly global phenomena was contained in one term. And a moment in the voice of the people, a very raucous moment, that voice was heard Mm -hmm. And then the place was able to move on. So th these are for me, like for me, it's still we're still dealing with something like like still rather beautiful checks and controls, even despite the absolute appalling spectacle we saw yesterday. I think that's a really interesting point. And in fact, I want to take that to, to Jonah, uh, you know, because Jonah, every time I have an argument with my uh, American friends and I always say to them that the media, your media is so much freer than ours. Your institutions are so much freer than ours. And from their perch, it's like it's, it, it's not a reality they've ever known. They're like, what are you saying? Big media is all captured. I'm like, if your big media is all captured, try coming here and see what's happening to our media. Right. So it's all relative. So for someone like you, who's actually worked with the previous administration, who's worked worked at Capitol Hill, who's worked at the Senate. This must be absolutely surreal. And unlike Sadanand and, and, and Atish's relative optimism, right? Uh, and I think Casey has a more sort of realistic view of the Trumpism of America. How do you actually see it? Um, well, first, I, uh, would ver I, I would just have to say as an American, I'm, I'm so embarrassed. I am so deeply embarrassed today. Uh, there have been many instances when I've been embarrassed over the last four years, uh, but I'd have to really dig deep to find a time when I have been quite as embarrassed as I am today. Uh, I would love to get back to America to discussion of that um, because there's a lot that I have to say on it. 
But I would like also, Barkat, to address your the point that you asked first, which is so important. Will this uh, cause America to retreat from um, encouraging democracy, encouraging freedom, encouraging support for the press on other friendly countries? Uh, because I think that's really an important point, and I want to make sure we don't stray too far from it. And I think it must, uh, when my old boss Joe Biden is president, thank God in less than two weeks, I really do hope that he does not back off that important mission. Uh, when I worked for Joe Biden, uh, it was uh, the first part of it was during the Bush administration when the America that I loved was a country that was torturing people and was engaged in a tremendously unwise war in Iraq. It was difficult to go to other countries and say, you've got to uphold democratic norms. You shouldn't torture people. You shouldn't threaten your neighbors. But what I always would say was, don't take us in America as perfect. We've strayed. Take us as a cautionary example. Learn from what we do wrong. We democracies have to encourage each other, not by saying everything is okay, but by pointing out our flaws, uh, pointing them out hopefully as one friend to another. So I hope that we Americans will uh, approach the world with greater humility than we have in the past. And I think it really should not have taken a tragedy like we've seen today to have forced this humility upon us. That's a great point. And I just want Casey and Sadanan to quickly respond to that. I'll start with you, Ambassador Casey Singh, because there's an expectation that as the Biden administration takes charge, especially from an Indian perspective, you are going to see more commentary on India's human rights records, civil liberties records, whether it's the crackdown on NGOs or the treatment of minorities or issues like love jihad. You saw Biden talking about the citizenship legislation, for example, in his campaign. Now, when the Biden administration does that, given what's just happened, at Capitol Hill. Will it be, as Jonah says, uh, still the world's most powerful country uh, being able to exercise leverage uh, no matter what? Or will there be a kind of, hmm, really from India and other countries? Let me just unmute you. Sorry, sir. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, Jake Sullivan, the NSA designate, was on the free the Zakaria program. Uh, and he put it very well. Their vision, and he was obviously reflecting the vision of President. President-elect Biden, he said, we have to go through back to the middle class values. We have to go back to our values. And foreign and domestic policies are intertwined. Uh, now, in case of Trump, they, they had no connection at all. It was America first. You could beat up who yeah. you wanted. As long as you did a trade deal, he couldn't be bothered. Uh, but now look, yesterday, the Chinese, what they have done in Hong Kong, uh, the editor-in-chief of Global Times, the English voice of the Chinese establishment, jocularly uh, calls it Washington uh, Spring, you know, to call it Arab Spring. Now, the Chinese are gloating like that. But, the, you know, therefore, uh, Biden, whatever one can gather from Sullivan's talk and other people, I think he'll go back to fundamentals. He'll go back to the foundations of America and American power, the city on Shining Hill. We heard him yesterday. Uh, we also heard the leader, uh, the Senate majority leader, who will be minority leader now. That there is yeah. actually within Senate also consensus that they had, they've just set forth on a wrong track. But how would we react? Back. How would other countries react? That, uh, that, no. that, that, that moral position that the United States of America once enjoyed on the basis of its very free institutions, on the basis of being the world's uh, oldest democracy. Today, I think a lot of people are going to say that, look, the lesson to us is we need to first fix our own house. Who are we to lecture anyone else? I, I, I know a lot of Americans would be saying that. And quickly, Casey, I want to take the same point of Sadan and then Atish. Actually. No, so that's that's the confidence that uh, that uh, President Trump will have to, rest uh, President Biden will have to restore. Uh, so that's a challenge. As I said, he had announced he'll have a gathering of democracies. But you just see what the Chinese have done. They got RCEP, a huge trade agreement with one. They got investment agreement with Europe. So they've shown the decoupling hasn't worked. You can't isolate them. People need their markets. So how do you counter them? Okay. And on top of that, you got a, you know, a, a sedition-causing uh, former president exiting, who's probably not going to give up his bullhorn and going to go around making more trouble at the street level. So he'll yeah. be President, President Biden will have fighting on two different fronts. One right. is abroad and one is at home. 
so let me let me just bring Sadanand in. You know, Sadanand, uh, at a different moment uh, in time, I was interviewing not so long ago Kishore uh, Mehbubani, uh, who was making the argument that human rights is an overrated card that countries play with 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 each other. That basically all countries are driven by self interest. Let's not get to embroiled in these human rights conversations. The context was China's treatment of its uh, of its Muslims uh, and and how they've been placed in internment camps and so on. Uh, do you believe that there will be a shift in how the United States both looks at the world and its own place uh, in that world order? And let me just give me half a second. I need to unmute you and then you can respond. Go ahead. Yeah. Look, Barkha, I think uh, the point you raised is absolutely valid. Uh, it's certainly true that this is an embarrassing moment for the United States. And it's also certainly true that many people are going to look at this as a moment to introspect rather than as a moment to preach. Um, However, you know, there's one element of the kind of schadenfreude that I'm seeing on social media and elsewhere. I mean, it's understandable at an emotional level, right? Imagine if you're, you know, someone sitting in Karachi or sitting in uh, Madras or, 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 or wherever, and you always sort of have, you know, someone writing in an American newspaper or an American show or some visiting American diplomat, you know, telling you how you could be doing better. And then it's just a sort of, it's a very natural human response, right? So I loved your response to Marco Rubio, for instance, and absolutely spot on, fantastic. Um, but if you, you know, if we step back from that for just a moment, uh, it's not in anybody's, anybody who believes in democracy's interest to see democracy in the US falter. Now I'm closer to Atish's view on this in the sense that I think that, you know, uh, the, 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 the institutions have been tested, but they have held. They have not held in many other places. But at the same time, you have to acknowledge that this is a trying time for, uh, for US democracy. And the trying time is not going to end on January 20th just because Trump is no longer in the White House and Biden is in the White House. Yeah. But uh, um, in yeah. terms of what the, I, I think that it is absolutely vital for the US foreign policy uh, for the Biden administration uh, to put democracy back at the center, quite simply for geopolitical reasons, among other things. Um, the truth is that uh, Xi Jinping represents a different model. Kishore Mahbubani, who, I mean, who has been, I watched that interview on your show. I think he rep he's basically lawyering for the Chinese model, if you sort of, if you want my view. And there are people who are arguing that you don't need democracy. It's inefficient, it's messy, it's loud. And there are many people across the world, especially in the developing world, who are receptive to those arguments, including precisely those kind of right-wing populist authoritarian leaders who want to sort of, you know, accumulate power. So the U.S. will have no choice but to have uh, to for to retain democracy as part of its foreign policy mix, uh, even though this particular moment uh, certainly is a moment of embarrassment. So uh, I think you make a fair point that there's a kind of natural ha ha ha. And then when you step back from it, uh, you know, of course, I think it's in the world's interest to have America's uh, institutions function. I still believe the United States of America is the freest country in the world. Uh, I, I think I can say that despite uh, the chaos uh, and, and the near coup attempt at Capitol Hill. But Atish, uh, I don't know if I said that today, how many takers there would be for that statement. Because Dr. Fahim Yunus, for example, who's this kind of COVID guru, who tweets from the front lines. He had a hilarious tweet today. He's of Pakistani origin. And, and he said, oh, this is why I left Pakistan, looking at those shots, right? And I thought it was a really funny tweet because I mean, you know, his home country has been famous for failing to peacefully uh, transition power. And actually, Pakistan, theoretically, without the institutions actually being democratically deep, has not seen these kind of crazy scenes. Right, right. What, what, what we would have seen instead in Pakistan would have been the Supreme Court justice would have stepped in. He would have dismissed Biden and Trump would be kind of forced in through a side door. And, you know, we would have like five years and then we would stumble into something. No, it's 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 not that really there isn't an equivalency. And, and to your what you were saying earlier, you know, it's not a bad thing for um, America, it, like I've seen a kind of transition to a more knowing country and it began actually around 9-11. I remember being a student here. There was a great sense of like superiority of a sort of like Kenneth Galbraith type uh, diplomacy, very high handed, kind of magnificent in its own right. But it was not it, would, it didn't have a, a, a very real knowledge of the world in the last 20 years. 
the diplomatic establishment, the, the way that the press covers the world, what you're seeing on every level is, is a society that's much, much more knowing. And as a result, not quite as smug or superior as people like to make out. And it's not a bad thing to have had this like very rough like moment where you felt your own freedoms periled and you've had to defend them and you've had to stand up for them. In my opinion, like it would make American diplomacy more humane, more sympathetic, more able to see in the experience of others a shade of one's own, which is, which is something more convincing. Mm -hmm. uh, let, me, let me get Jonah in. Jonah, you said that you were very, very embarrassed as an American. You don't remember the last time you were this embarrassed. Can I, can I ask you, just, just for curiosity's sake, what's another moment that came even remotely close? When you when you felt as an American disashamed? Oh, Barka, actually, to be honest, there are a lot. Uh, definitely during the years when torture uh, was an instrument of U.S. policy, Abu Ghraib, Gitmo, under the Trump administration, there have been so many times, whether Charlottesville, children in cages, Muslim ban, um, one could just go on and on. Uh, I've lived outside of the U.S. Uh, since 2018, in large part because I did not want to raise my biracial kids. They're half Daisy. I didn't want to raise them in Mr. Trump's America. So I think that we really have gone uh, very much on a dangerous path. And on the one hand, I am delighted and overjoyed that my old boss uh, is going to be the next president. Uh, in full disclosure, I've um, advised the campaign informally. I, I uh, have been doing whatever I can to make that happen. So I don't want to pretend that uh, I've just been sitting by and uh, being a completely dispassionate observer. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, I'm very worried that 74 million Americans looked at the past four years and said, yes, give me more of that. I'm very worried that thousands of them uh, staged an occupation of the Capitol building, a place I worked for 12 years, and that they honestly believe that an election that Joe Biden won fair and square, it wasn't even close, that they, they believe the lie that this election was stolen. I wish all of this would just vanish in two weeks, but it won't. Yeah. Uh, and so do you agree with Sadanand uh, that democracy will have to continue to be at the center of the American project, both at home uh, and abroad? Or do you believe that the United States of America needs to focus on the home turf before it can go preaching to other countries? And I am reminded of that time. And I like I, I may have forgive me. Uh, some of you may have heard me quoting this example before uh, when Obama as president comes to the U.S., uh, has a great trip, but reminds the, India of, uh, you know, the constitution guaranteeing diversity and equality uh, to all, all religions and all communities, and then takes a flight from here to Saudi Arabia and obviously does not make the same points there, uh, which speaks to a kind of transactional diplomacy even when it comes to human rights. And I think that's why so many people, even people like myself who studied, who grew up in in New York, who, who love America as a second home, uh, there is a kind of cynicism when we hear the Americans lecturing us. We may be really angry at some of the things going on in our country, but we can't bear to be lectured by the Americans or anyone else. I think there's a lot of Indians who feel that, Jonah. Yes, Parker, you, you make an excellent point, and it shouldn't have taken this to remind us. Um, we shouldn't be lecturing anyone. Nobody should be lecturing anyone. We should be putting democracy, in my view, at the centerpiece of our program, but not from a position on high. The way that I always try to approach it as a former government, when I was in government and outside, is, say, is by first off acknowledging America is not a perfect democracy. America has never been a perfect democracy. If there is a perfect democracy out there, I've never seen it. So we've got to come to it without preaching, without lecturing. We've got to come to it as a flawed democracy, like every other democracy, and say, look, we all are flawed. We've got to help each other be better. And part okay. of being better is by not whitewashing 
our own flaws. That's what a friend does. A friend doesn't tell you that everything is fine when you are doing something that is self-destructive because India's democracy shouldn't be better for the sake of the United States. It should be better for the sake of India. Uh, my friends in Pakistan, I've lived in both India and in Pakistan, and my, friend, and my friends in both countries want democracy not to make the United States happy, sure, but to, sure. to make a better life for themselves and their families. Okay, let, okay, me, just, let me just uh, uh, at, this point, at this point uh, welcome also to the broadcast. Uh, we've got uh, Professor Ashutosh Varshney from Brown University joining uh, the special broadcast. Uh, we've also got uh, Ambassador Neelam Dio, veteran diplomat, uh, joining the broadcast. Welcome both to the program. I'll just let uh, uh, Sadaran and Atish respond briefly to what Jonah has said because Ashutosh may have uh, caught only the last strands of it and then uh, we'll actually move on. Uh, Atish, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go to you first. Uh, you know, I think. I think Jonah spoke quite from the heart, and I think all of us go through these twists with our own countries, the journeys they take, the shape and form our democracies take. Certainly, uh, all of us have gone through very different ideological journeys, uh, you and Sadanand in particular, vis-a-vis -vis India, uh, for example. So one can relate to what Jonah is actually saying. Go ahead, Atish. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think that this has become, it's sort of become like the bane of our existence in India, where everything is like, oh, our image, oh, how are we looking abroad? Oh, like, my, my God, it, if somebody says something like this tremendous sense of affront. And Jonah's absolutely right. Like, you have to find a place of autonomy where if you want these changes or if you want your country to look a certain way, it's because of a certain inner life in your own society and you're not, in, you're not trying to make yourself in the image of another country. But yeah. these were our values, I mean, they were deeply enshrined in our system. And when they're imperiled, as they have been in America, and you see America kind of jumping to the defense of those values and in some way standing by them, and new consensuses forming, which include like, like there's been a populist revolt through the world. If, if you see that and you kind of, you're able to absorb it and you're not able to lose your system, well, that's a very important lesson. and regardless of whether it chaffs to look at some other country or whatever, it's something that we would do well to do ourselves because we don't want to be like, I was in Turkey uh, a few weeks ago and it's horrible to see that country, just everything, the, the lights have gone out, you know? And, 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 yeah. and so, so, the, so the American example should not be something that should intimidate us, but it should be something that's kind of like inspiring for, for us, for our own defense of our values. Sure. Uh, uh, also want to welcome to the broadcast Ravi Agarwal, the Editor-in-Chief for Foreign Policy, but I'll just get Sadanan uh, to respond and then we'll open it up for Ravi Ashutosh and Neelam uh, when she can reconnect uh, with us. Uh, Sadanan, uh, go ahead. So, Parka, let me quickly, let me quickly, you know, piggyback on Atish's point, right? I mean, if you sort of, you know, look at it from your vantage point sitting there in Delhi, now how does it improve your life at all um, as a journalist, as a public intellectual, if let's say hypothetically freedom of speech were to be diminished in America, it doesn't. It actually makes your it makes things worse. And I think that is why so much of the gloating you see is from people who, in fact, are opposed to democratic values. These are people who but do so not. So many of these people. Of but so many of these people. Sorry to interrupt you, but so many of these people have been Trump fans, right? One. Precisely. Precisely. I'm and, and, and today I was actually told by one of the right wing ideologues on Twitter, Ratan Sharda, uh, he said, well, you supported dissent at Shaheen Bagh in a JNU, so why do you have a problem? Firstly, he sort of assumed certain things about my, my politics, but this was his tweet that you you guys didn't have a problem with movements at Shaheen Bagh. Uh, you didn't have a problem with movements at, at JNU, so why do you have a problem with this? Be consistent. So that is the kind of... Uh, right-wing narrative we're seeing in India. So sorry, so that but, it's in, but it, it's in such poor faith because no one has a problem with the peaceful protest. People only have a problem with the people who you know who stormed uh, the capital. So first of all, that argument you know that 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 you're hearing uh, simply isn't true. Um, but secondly, I think that the people who are making it are very often people who are inimical to democracy and inimical to democratic values. And I think it's important for us to push back. Uh, it doesn't. Let's just let's just say they're right, and let's just say that the you know that 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 democracy in the U.S. doesn't survive. Um, what does that mean for the world? What does that mean for India? And I would argue that uh, actually that would make lives around the world uh, much much worse for people. 
So it's fine to sort of, you know, look at this every now and then from a nationalist prism, but it's mm -hmm. also possible to detach ourselves from the values. And I have to say, I agree with, with Jonah over there that, you know, we, wherever we are, if we happen to believe in these kind of core principles and values, we should be able to espouse those values, even if the place where we are in may not be able to, may, may not be living up to them perfectly. Okay, fair enough. Let's get uh, Ashu Varshni and uh, Ravi Agarwal uh, into the conversation. Ashu and Ravi, uh, we've been talking about, uh, you know, whether uh, sort of this is this has brought a number of American delusions uh, sort of, uh, you know, home to roost. Uh, also, Marco Rubio's third world reference that, that drew a lot of schadenfreude and smirking around the world and also whether Americans can still afford uh, to make uh, democracy uh, sort of lectures to the rest of the world, uh, part of their their foreign policy and part of their positioning uh, in the world. Uh, Ravi, I'll take that to you first. Go ahead. So, you know, um, uh, uh, just to play off some of what uh, uh, Sadan and, um, uh, and, and Ashish were saying earlier, um, I think democracy is messy and it's fine for it to be seen to be messy as long as it is constantly corrected and rectified along the way. And I think uh, galling as these images are, uh, the videos are that the entire world has seen, I think it's really important as well to look at uh, the images later when when uh, Congress reconvened, uh, there was some some very sort of poignant speeches made about the importance of democracy, the importance of debate that is uh, not violent debate, but just reasoned debate. Um, and I think in a sense, look, uh, America's image has been hurt both internally and globally. There's no denying that. But, um, you know, from a foreign policy perspective, I do think that, that, that there is a narrative for America where it can emerge from this and say, look, uh, these are the things that went wrong. This is what we learned from it. Um, and this is how democracy can self-correct. Um, so I think it can still salvage that. But to do so, it still needs to take the next 13 days very seriously. Um, you know, President Trump is still in power. Uh, there are very serious people here who are discussing whether to, uh, you know, go for the 25th Amendment. There are people uh, within his administration who are planning to resign at this very moment. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think how America acts in the next few days and two weeks uh, really sets the tone for how history will judge uh, Wednesday's violent uh, mob actions. Yeah. Um, Ashu? Uh, yes. Um, what happened was truly galling. That's a very good description. Uh, but two things ought to be noted right away. Um, uh, one, January 6th was also the day when Georgia, state of Georgia, elected its first black senator in history. Uh, it was one of the most important Confederate states that led the that was at the center of the Civil War. And it was also the home of Martin Luther King. And in fact, the person who um, uh, was elected senator is a, is a pastor of the church that uh, with which Martin Luther King was associated. So I think we should not forget what was happening in the morning of January 6th. And one should uh, add it to what happened in the afternoon, and then add it to what happened after 8 p.m. By 3 a.m., uh, roughly after, just after 3 a.m., um, uh, uh, Biden had been, his election had been certified and confirmed. The, the certification had been confirmed by the U.S. Senate. So that's point number one. Something very important happened, which we need to take note of. A black senator from the state of Georgia, um, first black senator in history. Second, right. yeah. Uh, second, I think I don't know whether earlier uh, uh, earlier um, panelists have mentioned that something like this can is is more likely to happen in a presidential democracy than in a parliamentary democracy. Why? Because the legislature and the executive are two rival centers of power in the presidential system. And they can be under two different political parties, right? Which cannot happen in a parliamentary system because the parliament and executive are intertwined in a way which does not make them 
mm -hmm. uh, rival centers of power. So what the presidential system does, and this is a standard political science point, it's not something very original that I'm saying, very standard political science point. What a presidential system does is it shifts the contestation over power to the highest levels of the institution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which, which cannot happen in a parliamentary system. So, but but uh, one final thing we might want to note um, is that, um, ironically, this this galling event. This uh, I, I, we'll have to see whether it will be categorized finally as an insurrection or just a riot. I think that will be an important legal and political debate after January twentieth, when the once the attorney general has also been confirmed. Um, uh, uh, it should be noted that I, ironically, this event might have strengthened the hands of institutional Democrats in American politics. In all right. probability, it opens up space for yeah. President Biden after January 20th to do things he would have found very difficult. Otherwise. I think that's a very interesting point. And I just want to take it to Ravi and then take it back to, to, to Sadanand, Atish and Jonah who've been with us uh, for the last 30 minutes. Ravi, as galling as it is, as appalling as it is, it's actually created a kind of moral pressure on the Republicans that may never have existed. Otherwise, uh, it actually, I think, probably changed the pace at which that vote was counted and Biden was officially declared uh, president. And it actually probably empowers Biden. The question is does it empower the United States of America? Uh, you know, a, a deeply divided country uh, where uh, we haven't actually mentioned the, the, the fact that the people storming the Capitol were all white. And the reaction I've had from my African American friends has also been a very, very acutely felt uh, reaction, right? So the point on Georgia is well taken from Ashu, uh, but the race divide, uh, the, 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 the fact that this was also an assertion of white supremacy and not just of Trump support cannot be overlooked. Yeah, absolutely, Barca. Look, uh, you know, on your first point about uh, uh, sort of the, uh, the the morality of, of what happened and 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 whether um, the GOP has been shaken by by Wednesday's events. I mean, look, the writing was on the wall for a long time. I mean, Trump, as he often does, has signaled uh, January 6 was going to happen exactly the way it did for weeks. So in that sense, it shouldn't be a surprise. And I don't think members of the GOP should get a pass um, for, for sort of suddenly realizing that, that, that these were calls for insurrection that were public uh, on social media and on many broadcast channels here in the United States. That's one. Two, um, on the point of race, uh, you make an excellent point, and, and many people have uh, made the comparison with the Black Lives Matter protests, the, the George Floyd protests across America, where let's not forget tens of thousands of people were, were put in prison for very peaceful protests. Uh, in which they were exercising their First Amendment rights um, and were often met with tear gas and police brutality. On the other hand, the protesters who stormed the Capitol, they um, abandoned their First Amendment rights the minute they breached the Capitol, the minute they got inside, uh, <laughs> carrying IEDs in some cases, uh, and with weaponry. That was the moment when they were legally, you know, any arrest that, I mean, it, 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 they were, very few people were sort of held in, 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 in this sort of storming uh, of the Capitol. And so that contrast, I think, is something that needs to be examined uh, and investigated uh, in the coming weeks. And then lastly, about Biden. Um, you know, in a sense, Biden was born for this moment. He is a creature of the Senate. He is a centrist. Um, a 50-50 uh, Senate split, in a sense, is ideal for him because, um, you know, what it means is that on the one hand, he can push through some democratic reforms that everyone agrees on. But on the other hand, uh, he won't be held hostage by people, um, you know, towards the, the, the further left of his party, uh, the, the progressive wing. Uh, that may have policies that Biden himself may not be that comfortable with. Yeah. And so yeah. in that sense, the constraints now imposed by the Senate, the moment uh, he's publicly called for decency uh, time and time again, um, in that sense, uh, uh, I think he will find that the situation suits his style of leadership and his rhetoric. So I want to take that to Jonah uh, 
straight away. Sorry, I'm just going to mute you, Ravi, so we have less echo. Uh, Jonah, you've worked with Biden, right? Uh, there, there is, uh, in fact, can we pull that photograph out? Uh, there's a photograph I know that Jonah has pinned to his Twitter feed. We'll try and bring it up before the program actually closes with, of you and Biden. Uh, I, I find it interesting that Ravi uses the word centrist at a time when the word is so sullied. Uh, it's personally an identity I relate to. I hate polarities mostly because I think they flatten conversations uh, and they don't, they, they, they don't allow countries and nations to come together. But in the times that we live in, centrist is equal fence sitter, right? That's how especially millennials use the word. There are any number of people who've said things like, oh, how was Biden really different from Trump? Biden was this big grand establishmentarian. Uh, has that debate been closed once and for all, given what the hell just happened at the Capitol? That there that's, is a real thing, it's called being a centrist? That, that's a very good question, Barka. And uh, you're right, I do, um, I have um, not only worked for Biden, but I've, uh, one of the virtues of working for uh, a senator, because he was the chairman of foreign relations when he was my boss, is that you're not surrounded by an army of other people. Uh, for nine years, I almost 10, uh, I spent a lot of time with him. We traveled to war zones, we traveled to India, we traveled all, uh, all over the world. And I can immodestly say that I think I know him pretty well. And what you see really is what you get. Um, I don't really think centrist is the best uh, description of him. He's not a radical lefty, but neither are most of the other people whom the Republicans call radical lefties. Uh, and Joe welcome, Biden- has, Welcome to all of our worlds, but yeah, go yes. ahead. Yeah. And, and I think one of the things that's underappreciated about Joe Biden is that he really has a deep, passionate moral core. People sometimes do describe him as, uh, as if the Senate were his only life. Uh, but uh, you, get, um, you get his dander up a bit on something that involves a moral issue and get out of his way. He's not going to like that one bit. And it's utterly genuine. So I think we are going to see a lot of this. We have seen it during the campaign. Uh, the way he described his whole campaign was a, a campaign for the soul of America. And that wasn't just rhetoric. That was true. Um, he didn't need to do this at the age of 77, now 78. Uh, he was so morally offended by Donald Trump's uh, praising of white supremacists after Charlottesville that he felt it his moral duty to get into a race that, quite frankly, it was by no means certain he was going to win. Uh, if you go back to February, he was running fifth out of uh, his competitors. So I think we're going to see uh, a lot of things that might be a little bit surprising. Obviously not everything, but Barca, on your point of centrism, I think it it's not really the right um, place to see this. And this gets back as well to Ashu's excellent point that in some ways, I won't say the most important um, news, but at least the most encouraging news was the election of two senators, uh, two Democratic senators in Georgia, which quite frankly, I did not expect to happen. Uh, and the fact that uh, Reverend Raphael Warnock is the first African-American senator elected from the Deep South ever, one of the, the only a dozen African-American senators ever to serve in the U.S. Senate, this is big news. This really matters. So yeah. even though I am uh, a little bit less optimistic uh, than uh, Sadanan and Atish about uh, America's ability to bounce back. I am a little bit more worried about the 74 million. <laughs> There's me in you the wanna, you, wanna tell, you wanna tell us about that photograph quickly before we, yeah. uh, before we go to uh, Atish and Sadanan? Yeah, this, uh, this was taken in uh, January of 2009 uh, after uh, Joe Biden had been elected vice president. Can we just get it up again? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Uh, the yeah. last, I, I, last trip I took with him to Afghanistan, uh, I'd attached it to my Twitter feed where I told a different story that happened in February of 2008, uh, simply because this was a better photo. <laughs> the other one, uh, uh, we didn't have a good photo from it. Uh, but we took a lot of helicopter rides together. But the important uh, thing there, and the reason I'd put that up on Twitter was that uh, I can go through the whole story, but the, the punchline essentially is that after we were stranded 
for six hours on an icy ridge line with Taliban all around us, uh, Joe Biden showed incredible decency to the soldiers and State Department officials who were keeping all of us safe and never once blamed anyone for uh, something that one could imagine, not only Donald Trump, but a lot of other politicians uh, getting a, a little bit testier about. Okay, let's 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 open this up. I know uh, some of you are on very very small time windows, and we've got 10, 15 minutes left, so let's uh, race it along. Uh, Atish, uh, I want to pick up on two points that we've heard, new points in the conversation. One, that presidential democracies lend themselves more uh, to to this kind of behavior than parliamentary ones. Uh, two, to Ravi's point that Biden may actually end up becoming stronger. And three, actually three points to Jonah's point that hey, don't call him a centrist now. What do we call him if we don't? And are there instructive lessons for the rest of our countries, our parts of the world, where similar polarities are breaking up relationships, breaking up families, uh, leading to situations where people can no longer talk to each other if they're politically different? I think Indians are fast reaching, uh, by the way, that kind of point that the Americans have been at uh, for a while. I don't mean what happened at Capitol Hill. I just mean in terms of the polarity. Well, I, I really wanted you to get into that territory, which is much more, I suppose, the territory of the cultural implications of Trump. And, yeah. you know, I've been I've been in Tennessee for Christmas and, you know, we were we were sort of driving down massive Trump signs the minute they started. They started in Pennsylvania themselves. And we were there. People were like very flagrant, especially in Tennessee, which was the world hotspot for the pandemic, not wearing masks, clearly taking a cue from Trump. And. It was for me like such a reminder because I keep making those blocks in my mind. I was like joking with my husband. I was like, oh, we're in Virginia. We're still a blue state. Now we're crossing into a red state. And oh, wow, Georgia is a blue state. But, you know, and he's like, he was saying, he said, listen, it's the same country everywhere. Blue cities, a red heartland and suburbs that change here and there. And uh, the Trump coalition is something that like, I've seen as a monolith, but to be down with Ryan's family in Tennessee, very, very religious people who probably did vote for him would be appalled by what they saw yesterday. So I'm very interested to know how the kind of cultural shakeup occurs in the months going forward, because Trump's world doesn't seem like a coalition. It seems like a distillation of some kind of purity, but it is a coalition and it may That's unravel. Interesting. That's interesting. That is that is interesting. Sadhana? So uh, just, sorry, Ashu, I know you wanted to come in. Just yeah. just let Sadhana make his point and then yeah. Sadhana, so but Sadhana. very quickly to to Jonah's point, you know, I, I just want to sort of um I'm not saying that I'm necessarily sanguine about the future. Um what I'm saying is that so far the institutions have held up and they have survived a battering that in many places they would not have survived. And I think Atish's point where the, you know, the comparison, I mean, the, he made the comparison with Turkey. You could also compare it with Hungary or other places where we've seen a powerful, charismatic right wing populist rise who absolutely subdues, subdues the judiciary, subdues the media, speaks directly to the people, speaks to uh, one subsection of the people, treats other fellow citizens as foreigners. It all sounds quite familiar to us in, 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 yeah. in, 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 in India, too. So, yeah. So, so I'm not. Uh, I don't think Trumpism simply vanishes when Biden becomes president. It's just that we haven't talked about that so much in this program. Yeah, I think that you know the there are elements of what it represents, which I think are you know genuine grievances that the system is going to have to find some way to address, uh, and there are elements of it that are fantasy that are linked to this person's peculiar personality. But even if you take Trump, the person, away from it. Um, I think the Trumpism or what he represents in terms of the uh, resentments or aspirations of the people who voted for him, uh, those yeah. don't go away in a democracy. And the challenge for American democracy is going to be finding some way to address what are genuine grievances while ignoring the element of this that is uh, fantasy or bigotry. Okay. Uh, Ashu and then Ravi, very quickly. Uh, Ashu, sorry, give me half a second. You're on mute. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I think Sadanan's point about institutional strength is important, very important. Um, Trump was first denied by state level authorities who acted very independently, including officials of Republican Party at the state level, especially in Georgia and, and Arizona. 
that should be noted that a, that it were they at the state level georgia republican officials the secretary of state and governor did not act in a partisan manner they did not right second it should be noted that 60 court cases he has lost uh, yes last night someone was saying 62 but let's say 60 odd cases yeah. he has lost the judiciary acted independently right from the the state level up to the uh, federal supreme court including judges appointed by him they played their institutional role they looked yeah. at evidence before pronouncing judgments right so losing 60 court cases tells you something about the strength of american judiciary right that is also a point that goes in in sadanan's direction uh, but finally uh, this whole question of trumpism after trump um, uh, i might want to add here that according to the us census and all demographic analysis by 2040 america will be a white plurality not white majority nation um, whites will be less than 50 percent that anxiety is especially felt in american south but not only in american south it's also felt in rural and small town america rural and small town america they they tend to be more white than black the cities are, are more uh, are very yeah. black by now right yeah. so i think the the changing demographic ratio of the United States is, uh, is, uh, is generating a, a certain kind of politics which will have to be taken okay. note of and polit American political system will have to respond to it in a way that is not destructive. Because I think okay. white supremacy cannot be allowed to rule. The system will not. We'll have to fight that. Okay, but that is that is X number, you know, that is still a few years away. Uh, let me start taking last comments and I'll start with you, Ravi. Uh, I think speak to uh, speak to the point that Atish and uh, Ashu have both touched upon, the cultural impact. Are people going to move further apart from each other or is this in a way going to draw a red line around these divisions where people, even those who liked Trump, at least some section of those who liked Trump are going to say, enough you know when biden walked out of uh, uh, one of his first comments that he made uh, in the middle of all this happening you could hear him walking off from the podium saying three times enough is enough is enough are a number of american people going to be saying that even those who don't like biden don't like the democrats you know i think a fair number will but we cannot ignore the fact that a lot of americans um you know, as 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 one of Trump's advisors once said, just have alternate facts. And, you know, I mean, I was watching Fox and some Newsmax uh, last night and already there's, uh, you know, an alternate spinning of what actually happened. There are, you know, rumors being inserted about how some of the protesters were actually Antifa uh, and we shouldn't even call them protesters anymore. They were, uh, it was a violent mob. But, you know, the, the, the narrative of what actually happened will continue to be spun. And I have no great faith um, that this is going to be some sort of a red line. I think if you look back at the last four years, there were many other moments that could have also served as red lines of different sorts, uh, and they didn't. And I think that that should be a lesson for us about what the last four years were and the fact that Trump has quite clearly signaled every single time what he's going to do. And I think he still is. Um, even when he issued a statement now that he's off Twitter um, saying that um, a transition will take place on the 20th. But then he added in that statement that, you know, despite the fact that, you know, I won the election and, you know, all the facts point to the fact that, you know, I was cheated out of it. You know, I, I, I don't think that uh, we're really going to see a, a giant unity moment. What we shouldn't ignore as well. I think is the role um, of, of some media and of social media. And I think the world hasn't fully grappled with how do you deal with leaders who have unfettered access to tens of millions of people? Um, so we, we haven't actually spoken about this, but can we take the chance to actually talk about Twitter and Facebook uh, blocking the, the American president? I'll just say one thing on that, I just, I just want to say that for all the shattered Freudian on this, I can't see this uh, happening in our part of the world. But I'll just say quickly on Twitter, it's too little and too late. Um, you know, Twitter has long been a forum for, you know, everything from uh, ISIS recruiters to uh, 
white supremacists to you know all kinds of racism and bigotry uh and it, it often just traffics unfettered same for facebook same for much of social media so you know it's 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 good that twitter did what it did uh yesterday uh facebook followed uh shortly thereafter a lot of people are giving them credit but really i i think if you take the wider span there's a lot that still needs to be done and i think the world needs to discuss regulation okay you're actually saying that it's time to discuss regulation of social media ravi that's a oh, provocative a segue to our last comments i've been saying that for a long time actually and regulation by whom well therein lies the problem uh it's 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 unclear and i think it would have to be led by america in a variety of ways uh given that these this is the major market for these social media platforms um but you know oftentimes europe has taken the lead um through gdpr with privacy concerns um there are you know intelligent people who are discussing and debating how various uh large countries can get together to try and formulate some policies uh not only to regulate social media but to build a larger plan uh around privacy uh around competition uh around data uh and these are you know i think increasingly serious issues um you know the internet in some senses is the wild wild west uh and it's mm -hmm. all happened so quickly uh that we haven't really as a global community stopped to think about what happens okay you i know ravi, uh, ravi you said you had to jump off uh, at exactly this point so i'm going to say thank you to you i'm going to take another 5 minutes to get closing comments uh from the others thank you ravi uh very provocative last word there it's time this brings home the need to actually regulate uh social media uh, let me start with you sadanand i know you're intrinsically against any regulation uh but here we are upon this moment where basically trump uh, constantly iterating that the election was stolen could have incited violence and it was a very peculiar situation uh, i do not know another country in the world where the president or the prime minister would have been blocked by social media platforms operating in those countries actually yeah i don't even think this would have happened in the us right this has happened as you mean you know th think of it in game of thrones turns right you know yeah. the mad king's grip on power is slipping and at yeah. that moment all his enemies come in with their knives So I don't yeah. think this would have happened, you know, three months yeah. ago. So it certainly didn't happen over the last four years. And he said many, many irresponsible things. You know, my worry about regulation very quickly is that uh, it all hinges on who decides. And yeah. I think that if this is used to shut out a point of view, a point of view that a point of view that with which I may disagree, uh, I think that would fundamentally harm democracy. So I'm not a very big fan, and I'm worried that I'm worried about big tech sort of overplaying its hand on this. So that's my sort of uh my fear but of course i mean um i do agree with what they did yesterday because i think those trump tweets very clearly uh were incitement to violence and you have to draw a line somewhere but i would draw that line very very liberally um you know just on my my closing thoughts is you know where we began about you know what all of this means for democracy now two things that i think we're going to have to grapple with not just in the us but in in many other places uh, the first is something that ravi touched upon which is that uh increasingly we all live in countries where people inhabit different realities now you could be you know living in india and assume that shaheen bag is some terrible terrorist camp and the farmers are all khalistanis and you know the, we we know people who exist who who for who genuinely believe this and aren't just posturing similarly you have people many people the 75 million people who voted for trump who are not necessarily bad people but they genuinely believe that he has been maltreated and that the election was stolen from him and that i think is much much more worrying the fact that you could have a large section of the population ending up believing that the system itself is not fair and yeah. we have to sort of find some way where you can have deep disagreement deep disagreement in politics is fine but have deep disagreement while agreeing that the system fundamentally we you both buy in fundamentally um into into the system and i think that is the challenge that has been highlighted by the events yesterday and that's a challenge that we're going to have to face going ahead yeah uh, ashu quickly and then um jona and At atisha uh, yeah i have I, i don't think i'm in uh, i've reached a point in my political analysis where i would support um regulation of social media um in as a policy 
Um, I don't know. I think I'm I'm in intrinsically more um, sympathetic to what Sadanan is saying. Regulation can lead to lots and lots of problems, but uh, we have to find as an intellectual community and political community a way to deal with the following problem that um the that the social media more than any other media that we've known has completely blurred the distinction between opinions and facts mm -hmm. and and secondly lies can be paraded as alternative truths on social media yeah and if you have access to 85 million people and even 10 million of them and 15 million of them believe the the, the 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 lie that you're propagating then the system acquires properties which we have to figure out how to deal with um it is it it creates all kinds of instabilities it creates all kinds of problems so uh, while i'm not in uh, instinctively in favor of regulation we'll have to figure out some way of handling this problem um i don't think we are there yet but but this this has to be this has to be one of the more important things we do in the next five to ten years. Yeah, but the problem uh, I think Jonah would be that the way big tech acts in the United States of America, where there is a, a kind of uh, sort of congressional oversight which is very transparent, is just not the same as how big tech would act in India, where there isn't even that transparency in how mainstream media uh, newsrooms uh, process their decisions. Right. So I find this regulation business really complicated. Also, I think it doesn't understand the nature of tech because even if you blocked Trump, how are you you going to block? Like, how many of his followers are you going to block from saying the same thing? It actually speaks to a lack of understanding of the nature of tech yes the I think that, yes i think the the tech side of it is a whole other discussion that i'd be delighted to come on uh, yeah. another time to uh, discuss um i'd really like to just spend the last uh, little segment that i've got to touch on a point that atish brought up and a point that uh, both uh, ashu and uh, saranan uh, brought up and kind of tried to draw them together uh, in my putting on my uh, my hat as an anthropologist, I think we've got to look at and understand this phenomenon of these 74 million people who voted for Trump. As this says, these are uh, members of our families. They are members. They are our friends. Uh, it's tremendously painful to me to know that. There are so many places in America where I can go, where people will accept people who look like me, but will not accept my sons and people who look like my sons who are half Daisy. As an anthropologist, I've got to understand that. Uh, but then putting on my hat as a policymaker, as a former government official, uh, I have to address what Ashu and what Sadatan brought up, that these people are not going anywhere. We can't wish them away. They're part of the political process. We can't simply um, uh, pretend that that's not the case. We have to come up with a solution. And I would suggest that the way of knitting this together is by finding a way of integrating the people without integrating their more noxious ideas. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. white supremacy has no place in America or in any democracy. But those 74 million people, many of whom knowingly or unknowingly uh, support this awful concept, we, we're stuck with them. And many of them uh, can really be, uh, must be seen as our friends and family. And it's our job to do this. That's Joe Biden's biggest and most important mission. And quite frankly, that's the mission for all Americans. This is such an interesting point that I'm actually, uh, instead of closing with Atish, I am going to ask Sadan and then Ashu to respond to it as well, because there is resonance for, uh, or, you know, for all Indians. And Atish, uh, you know this, right? In all of our, if not families, certainly in our circle of friends, uh, there are people uh, who are anti-Muslim, who are bigoted towards Muslims. So if in, in our country, it plays out along religious lines. Sometimes it plays out uh, along caste lines. In the United States of America, it tends to play along, uh, you know, race much more uh, than religion, uh, but also religion. Right now, let's go back to Hillary Clinton and the basket of deplorables comment. Let's go to a Rahul Gandhi who recently made a judgment of, of people who, who voted for Modi. And, you know, there, there is a sense that in both cases, that was a grave mistake, that actually what we're really saying 
is that if we do not find a way to engage with prejudice, it's going to erupt in the way that it did in Capitol Hill. And frankly, the left, you know, isn't ready. And I and I'd call out the left on this. They'd be like, "Why? Why should we? In, in, why should we talk to these people? We don't want to live in neighborhoods where I, I have friends who 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 obviously hate Trump and say they won't live in neighborhoods where there are homes that are Republican voting." Atish, well, it's uh, Barca. It's complicated for two reasons. One is that, like, of course, I I detest the idea of being out of sympathy with large groups of people, of dehumanizing them, of turning yeah. people into political ideologies. I hate that idea. At the same time, like one has to be careful that when, an, if an ugly idea takes hold among a group of people in the form of an ideology, whether it's Hindutva or Jihadism or Trumpism, like one also has to be quite unequivocal in one's victory because those people are not waiting with their hands open want to, want to make friends immediately yeah. like you do have to kind of you have to kind of assert yourself and assert the kind of victory you've made and not be too apologetic and at the same time kind of re retain a certain mental fluidity to yeah. not, um to not turn people into ciphers to not turn them not, not to, to, to not sort of erase them, erase their humanity. And, and, the and, and, and yet never before, unlike never before, we look for this kind of ideological purity in our friends, in our relationships, in our neighborhoods that we never used to, I think, 20 years ago. Very quickly to this point, Ashu and then Dhuve uh, gets the last word. Ashu? Um, I think we should note that the last time white supremacy triumphed uh, in America, after the Civil War, that's roughly 1876, 77 onwards, it led to uh, your, your, um, your uh, listeners, your audience, your viewers might want to know that black Americans got the right to vote in 1870, eight years, uh, six years after the end of the Civil War, but they lost it all over the South by 1890. Not only did they lose their right to vote, they also were segregated and they were lynched. Yeah. So, so there cannot be any compromise with, with the extreme forms of prejudice. There cannot be. Um, it's, it took until 1965 for black Americans to get their voting rights back and until 1964 to get the civil rights. I'm not, I'm not saying compromise with the ideas. I'm right. saying we all but, know these people. No, no, I understand. We know variations of these people. They are in our homes, they are in our families, they are in our lives. Right, right, right. The laws, the laws have to deal with extreme forms of prejudice of course, in a serious manner. But of politically, course. the challenge, of course, is that a lot, as, as Jonah put it, um, Jonah, incidentally, was also someone who introduced me to to, uh, to President-elect Biden because Jonah is my former colleague from my earlier days. Um, so, as Jonah rightly put it, the the there are forms of this prejudice which are politically amenable, hmm? and forms of politics can be launched to bring them back to the to to a, more, a saner form of politics. Extreme prejudice, we, we will have to very strictly deal with. So you need to make a distinction between extreme prejudice and a more, uh, to, to use a paradox, more benign form, which can be, which has to be politically handled, not legally handled. Okay, Sadhanand, I mean, I just want to, I don't know that I need to say this. I'm not making a defense for engaging with, pre with, with prejudice in terms of endorsing it or forgiving it uh, or looking the other way from it. But how do you not talk to people who, who vote in a way that you think endorses the politics of hate. This is a polarized conversation that is happening globally from India, from New York to New Delhi. Yeah, I think you have to basically find a way to separate, you know, the people who are genuine bigots and the people who happen to be, for various complex reasons, uh, supportive or more supportive of uh, of of a party that has that uh, those elements. I mean, I think I don't think that all seventy five million people who voted for Trump are white supremacists. I don't think that everybody who votes for Narendra Modi or the BJP is a Muslim hating bigot. Um, nonetheless, I think there is a real problem 
when uh, a party like the BJP empowers people, uh, gives them uh, the you know a hold on the levers of power, who clearly and genuinely are Muslim-hating bigots, right? So that yeah. capacity to draw lines is very very important. Two last very quick thoughts, you know, I think that sort of pull together the some of the debates we're having both in the U.S. and India. Um, I think two things are 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 unhelpful. The first is that many of us or many people have started living politics as a kind of religion. And too much of people's identities is kind of invested in uh, either opposing or supporting a particular political figure. You know, there was a time when uh, where, when politics, politics just occupied, even for those of us who are commentators and journalists, just occupied less space. And I think that this idea of people really defining themselves by their political uh, leanings or by their allegiance to a particular person, uh, that's tremendously unhealthy. And the second thing is a tendency in the, uh, to use an overly broad brush when we are describing our opponents. And you see this on both sides where anybody who happens to have a disagreement with you, uh, I don't think that everybody who has a disagreement with me or even people I know or friends of mine who've served in the Trump administration, I don't think of many of them as bigots or white supremacists. I think there's a lot more. Com I don't think of, of Arthur's family members in Tennessee. I think there's a lot more complexity over there, and we have to pay attention to that complexity. And we, but that w without necessarily, you know, ignoring the fact that there are actual bigots. They really do sure. exist, and those people and their ideas we must oppose. And they did show up at the Capitol Hill. Four people died. Uh, Trump is gone. Trumpism is not. That one statement could be. Uh, a political metaphor uh, for more than one country in the world. Indeed, the images that we leave you with tonight are not images that the United States of America has ever seen. Most newer democracies have not seen this as well. We have seen some violence in the run-up in our election campaigns, but we have all been uh, at least structural democracies or electoral democracies. Uh, and that is the paradox of the United States of America today. If I were to uh, actually sum this up, I would say that the United States of America has been weaker as an electoral democracy than it has been. Uh, in other ways as a democracy. So in India, uh, the institutions of democracy have not grown roots that go deep enough, but our electoral democracy actually works quite smoothly. And in the United States of America, it seems to be the exact reverse. The institutions that are really tough to strengthen, free speech, the courts, they do their job. They do in the end do their job. But the simple thing of voting someone in, voting someone out and accepting that verdict, that the Americans seem to find a bit tougher to wrap their heads around. Leaving it there, Sadan and Dhume, Atish Tasir, Ashutosh Bajte, Jonah Blank. Apologies to Ambassador Neelam Adio, who could not join us. She made several attempts. Her connection just wouldn't hold up. And uh, to Ravi and Casey Singh before that. Thank you so much. Thanks to our audience. I'm sorry, I can see some 200 questions on our live stream. I just didn't have the time to take them today, but we'll be back tomorrow evening with another show, another deep dive into the big story of the day. So see you then. Thanks for watching. Thanks, everyone. Bye and have a great day.